Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jo Kelly Moore, and I'm Archdeacon of Canterbury. And I'm really sorry that you might be getting some horrible background noise uh, now that my uh, Zoom is open because uh, the, the thunder and lightning last night has had quite a big impact on internet connectivity today. So we've been having some real issues here in the cathedral precincts. Um, but it is a joy and a privilege to welcome you this evening to Connecting the Dots as in this refugee week that we think about how the issues of our globe are connected. And this evening, uh, welcoming as speakers tonight, uh, Joyce and Dominica and Raga, who are going to take us on that journey of connecting the dots. And that will become quite apparent. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this evening because we uh, really want to capture the addresses and, and any question and answer that comes. So our format is going to be uh, the three speakers will have the floor and then we will have some time for Q&A and Teresa Redfern, the, uh, our Dawson environmental uh, facilitator and um, chair of, and convener of our environmental working group is going to take the Q&A this evening. And um, communities and partnerships are hosting us tonight. So our director, Jonathan's in the house um, and the team here together tonight, Karen, who's our, um, our meeting host. Uh, it's, it's really good to be together. As uh, a reminder to on the recording front that if you, and some people are choosing this, if you don't want your smiley face on the, on the film, you can uh, turn your screen off and we respect that um, as, as we gather tonight, but we know we're, we're all in the room and we're all here together. Uh, to begin us and to think about connecting the dots, I think um, Sunday's gospel reading, which I, uh, like perhaps some of you in the room had the privilege of reflecting on in a congregation, joins the dots for us. I want to read from Mark chapter four as we begin and reflect very briefly and then lead us in prayer. And then I will be handing over to, to Joyce who will tell you a little bit about her as the other two speakers will as they get underway. From Mark's gospel, Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Those wonderful parables as the scriptures do, remind us that God, the creator, when we talk about the world in the scriptures, means the earth and all that dwells upon it. And in this gospel passage for Sunday Gone, we get that wonderful image of a sustainable planet where the way the earth is, is enabling natural processes to let the fruit of the earth flourish. And when that happens, the parables tell us, there is a home for every creature on God's earth, those with four legs and those with two. And tonight we're going to reflect on both of those things, a sustainable earth and a home for everyone. The scriptures invite us into that hope and into that challenge. And so let us pray as we reflect tonight. And we are challenged and encouraged as God's people. Creator God, we give you thanks for the beauty and wonder of the earth. For summer sun, for growth and flourishing 
for thunder and lightning and rain, for all you have made and invited us to till and keep so that it is sustainable. And God, we thank you that you have made this our home. Help us to make this place in it a home for everyone. Be with us by your spirit this night. Open our ears, our hearts, and our minds as together we serve and love you. We pray in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. Joyce, over to you. Hi, thanks. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, it, it's really made me think about the concept of home what is home? Where is home in today's um, in today's context of climate change? And I've actually travelled. Um, I've actually moved our family, and then my family. We've we've moved quite a lot um, from India to England to France, Germany, Canada, and back. Uh, but all of those have been voluntary. They've been uh, chosen moves. And this this tonight has really made me think: What would it be like what would it feel like to actually move because of um, uh, my talk which is focusing on climate change um, so I'm just going to share the screen uh, the PowerPoint with everyone can you all see that yeah okay Um, Joe began by talking about home and I've often wondered um, where is home and what is home and maybe you'd just like to think what words would you use to complete that sentence um, and then I'll, I'll put up a screen to show you what other people um, have used for that definition. If there's anyone who'd like to share one word or two words uh, with us this evening, please unmute and, and voice um, your, your words. That would be lovely to hear. No, no one's going to come forth. Okay, I'll let me share with you some contributions. I wonder if some of these words um, apply to you. Safety, uh, security, stability. I love Honey's description, home is a place blessed where you and your family can be secure, have all you need and share your sadness and happiness. And for Kelly, home is the base where everything um, begins. And then if you were to draw home, what, what pictures, what images would you include and I love uh, this one here from Sky, 12 year old um, young person. This is their idea of home, it's video games. <laughs> video games, it's, it's my room, it's my bed, uh, my family, my food. I, I think we all take so much of this for granted, don't we? Um, home is where the heart is, the laughter, the pain and the love, uh, a safe place, a place I wish to be at um, every second. Home is PJs and food, my family, and um, even if I'm, oh, I can't read that, my dad or older sister, it feels like they are there. It is my home, it is my heart. So I just love that. We take that all for granted, I think, don't we? Um, but, but home is, it, it actually defines us. It's a place um, that is physical. Philip Sheldrake tells us it's specific, it's relational, and it engages with all of us, our whole being, um, our history. I think that's very important. And our identity is absolutely rooted in the place called home. And of course, it's a place of belonging that that's I think when we leave home, we then realize what a strange place we are now inhabiting. Nothing is familiar. 
uh, we have to start again. We have to create relationships, but when we're home, we simply pick up, don't we, uh, from where we left off. It's just a beautiful place to, to go to. And I love this quote, quote from Simone Weil, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. So my question today is what happens when you lose that place of belonging and rootedness and you are forced uh, to leave? I, I just thought I would differentiate a little bit between migration and displacement. Uh, migration is the movement where you have a bit of choice and agency and you can go for all sorts of reasons. But displacement um, is the complete opposite. You are forced to move. It is really about survival. These are some of the drivers that, that cause people to move. Um, poverty, as we know, is, is huge. Lack of opportunities and employment. But we also have the other uh, factors, which is um, the persecution, religion, race, politics, war, conflict, human rights. We, we've certainly seen a lot of that, haven't we, recently with the whole um, movement from Syria and other places, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, uh, right the way through Europe, ending up quite sadly in Calais. Um, that's all part of these, uh, these drivers are, are partly the cause of that movement. Uh, but my concern here is, of course, the environmental drivers, um, those who are forced to leave, usually over a period of time because their, their um, life is getting untenable, they can't sustain um, home or employment and they simply have to leave. And we're talking, we, we know about floods, hurricanes and earthquakes um, which force people to leave. But there's also climate change, which, which exacerbates absolutely everything. We're very familiar with, with the term species loss and extinction, uh, deforestation, biodiversity loss, all of those, um, those um, facts. But climate change also um, impacts human beings tremendously, especially those in the poorer disadvantaged countries. Um, who have done hardly anything to cause climate change, but yet um, suffer the impacts the most. We know that you get the extremes with climate change. If you are living in a hot place, that place is simply going to get hotter. The surface land is going to increase, resulting in desertification, loss of crops. Um, if you have monsoons, heavy rains, that is going to increase as well. Um, and the sad thing about the Antarctica and Greenland, the ice sheet melt that's happening is proving to be quite irreversible um, and sea level rise takes place. And I think the scary thing about climate change is that um, its impacts are going to continue uh, for years and centuries to come. This is there's no quick fix at all. Some of these uh, things are quite irreversible. Um, and of course, people simply can't live perhaps year after year with, if you think about the Caribbean with typhoons uh, hitting um, their islands all the time, they simply can't keep picking up the pieces. So um, if we could just listen to a very short clip, this is focusing on um, climate change as a social justice matter. We know climate change has no boundaries. It impacts everybody uh, randomly, uh, unequally. Um, and there's also now inequality in, in how you are called, whether you're a climate um, refugee or a refugee. Um, there's differences which um, in the legal world um, impacts how you're actually treated globally. So let's take a listen to this. Uh, 
Um, if, if we're talking also about losing your home, I, I often think about the California wildfires. I listened to this story by chance on the radio and these are the final words of a woman who returns to paradise and there's nothing left. It just gives you a picture of, of loss of home, I think, and loss of place. It's very hard to imagine, isn't it, that loss? Um, 2018 was quite the year for climate change events. Um, we had the wildfires on the west coast of the states. Um, Cape Town, South Africa was approaching day zero. The water was running out. That was quite a scary time. Uh, the taps were, were simply um, not going to produce water um, if they didn't radically limit their usage. And then if anyone remembers the monsoon floods in Kerala, those were um, horrendous. They've never seen uh, monsoon rains like that or flooding. And I don't think we're aware actually, are we, until we see a sentence like this, um, of the mass movement of people caused by climate change. I want to just end with um, a short clip here. I was in Canada at the time of uh, Hurricane Katrina and I couldn't believe what we were seeing uh, in one of the richest, in the richest country probably in the world, how they were simply overwhelmed by uh, Hurricane Katrina. But I think this person simply summarizes everything um, that, that we need to, to be mindful of when we're talking about forced displacement um, and climate change. And just to end my, my um, presentation, um, this um, is a sculpture at Lille Cathedral uh, aimed uh, specifically towards refugees. Um, all people, um, you are welcome in this place. We, we see you, we, we, um, we connect with you, but it was designed specifically at, uh, particularly in mind for refugee people and it made, makes me think how important it is how we treat the other person uh, when they are displaced, how we welcome them um, and how we share our stories with each other. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, well, thinking on those things, I know as we hand over now to Dominique, you're going to pick up uh, so much of that. So um, hold up those thoughts, put any questions you've got in the chat and we'll, we'll keep moving on. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Domenica Pecoraro and uh, I am the refugee officer for Kent, for our Canterbury Diocese. Um, today I'll be presenting on uh, the connection between uh, forced displacement and climate change in particular, and I'll try to offer um, some information that will help us to understand a bit better this phenomenon. So let's look at a uh, forced displacement as a um, with a broader perception. We have to date 80 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. 80 million is a huge number and behind each number is a person and the, ma the vast majority of those 80 million people are young, are young and children. 
26.3 million people are refugees. As a refugee officer, uh, <laughs> I of often hear people talking about uh, forced displacement uh, as um, a phenomenon that it's impacting badly on their life. Um, but looking at the figure, uh, upon 80 million, uh, in 2020, the UK offered protection to 20,339 20, people. Um, the year before, the asylum seeking population uh, made up uh, for the 0.6% uh, of the entire uh, UK uh, population of 67 million. Everyone um, has got uh, their own opinion uh, on migration, asylum and refuge. However, I would love to provide uh, some facts so that we can all be um, better informed. Um, so uh, we could see that uh, the majority of uh, um, refugees are, are, are only hosted um, in five uh, countries. So Turkey um, is the country hosting the majority of refugees with 3.6 million, um, followed by Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda and Germany. The countries um, uh, from which uh, people are uh, more likely to be forcibly displaced from, um, you know, the Syrian Arab Republic, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. And my colleague Raja later on will focus particularly um, on South Sudan. What's the situation in Kent and the Southeast? Uh, we've seen the news, uh, we've seen um, the newspaper, uh, how we are as a region, as a county, overwhelmed. Uh, by the number of um, asylum seekers um, and unaccompanied asylum seeking children. However, however, um, looking at the figures, um, it's a very small number compared to the 80 million uh, global globally. So. Um, those figures are true to the end of May 2021. Um, we have around 400 unaccompanied asylum seeking children in Kent. Uh, they are younger uh, or 18. And then uh, we have over 1,000 uh, unaccompanied asylum seeking young people uh, of over 18 years of age. And Napier site uh, today. Uh, we had uh, 232 uh, forcibly displaced lives um, temporarily housed there. Um, in the whole of the southeast, there are 1,865 um, refugees resettled uh, through one of the uh, uh, government scheme, uh, the vulnerable person resettlement scheme. Um, Ashford has been the most a generous um, council um, with up to um, 250 refugees. In Canterbury, we have nine uh, refugee families and two community sponsorship uh, families in the Southeast. One is in Hythe and the other one is in Canterbury. How do these people arrive uh, in the UK? So those are the safe routes. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the top ones, um, so the vulnerable person resettlement scheme, the vulnerable children's resettlement scheme, and the, way the, the gateway scheme have now ended. Um, and in March, uh, we started a new resettlement scheme called the UK resettlement scheme. So in a broader scope, um, 
we would not only receptive people coming from the MENA region, but we would receptive people who need uh, to find sanctuary in the UK from all around the globe. Here in Kent, because of our uh, uh, geographical uh, position, uh, we are much more likely to see people arriving uh, spontaneously uh, crossing the channel um, by boat uh, at the back of the low race. Um, usually they are smuggled, uh, which means they, they voluntarily uh, pay someone uh, to help them uh, crossing, um, but a big portion is trafficked to the country. Um, that means that they've not given consent uh, to be uh, brought to this country um, for um, to be exploited. Looking at the latest um, figure uh, from the new immigration new plan for immigration. Um, by the end of uh, 2020, we had 8,500 people uh, crossing uh, the channel by those means. And we know um, of those who died um, and the children uh, who lost their lives, um, but the number of people who died um, is unknown crossing the channel. So, as Joyce pointed out, there are some links uh, between climate change and forced displacement. However, those are not as apparent. And also Joyce touched on the big uh, issue here, the fact that refugee, climate change refugees are not recognized by international law and they're not uh, protected by the uh, 1951 convention and lots of work is going on behind the scene to um, expand uh, the 91, 1951 convention um, to, in order for climate change refugees to benefit uh, from international protection. Look, the thing is that uh, people will come spontaneously um, because of famine, uh, because of drought, um, because being in their country means seeing uh, their family die and risking their own life are not recognized as uh, refugees. Climate change on its own does not displace people, but it is reinforcing underlying vulnerabilities such as increasing competition over resources, leading to intercommunal tensions, is impacting on livelihoods around the world. Climate change is creating conflict between farmers and herders of a lack of access to water. Climate change is intensifying competition over land. If we don't act together to, um, to care for the environment, to change our policies on climate change, to implement our policies on climate change. Climate change will push people to the edge, will increase tension, will increase conflict, and will increase the number of people forcibly displaced as a result. Before uh, finishing my presentation, I would like to offer um, a very short video um, as a spring point, a spring, um, um, as a springboard for uh, Raja's presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominica. And now I know that does absolutely open the door for our third and final speaker, uh, Raga. Welcome from, we've moved from Maidstone to Canterbury and now to Folkestone. <laughs> Over to you. 
Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Raja Jibril, popular as Raga, <laughs> and I live in Folkestone. Um, strangely enough, I actually kind of been on the move, I think, from the probably the first two years of my life. So coming to England, it wasn't my first kind of move. <laughs> wasn't the first displacement. Um, I was born in, in an era which is kind of uh, the country where I was born is Sudan, was actually raged with conflict. Um, you know, so I, I'm quite sure some of you have actually have seen some of, um, some of it in the news or kind of at least heard about the kind of mass refugees coming from Sudan at the moment to, to the UK. I mean, every time I actually see the boat, I kind of have ha, get hit with uh, this is kind of not the first time to see people in a desperate situation. And when, it, when is it going to be the last time for us to see people in, in that desperation, just trying to run away, to find some way to live and to find a way that they could live a dignified life. Um, so. Thank you so much, Dominica Joyce, for your br really brilliant presentation. I don't have much stat to give you, but I'd like to share my own personal record as a witness to the violence in Sudan and South Sudan. And just to tell you what's motivated me to do what I'm doing at the moment and what as well kind of making me feel there is a little hope and we can do something about it. Um, the first things I can recall uh, back in my memories, nine, early 1980s, I was a child and I remember there is war kind of everywhere in the Western kind of part of Sudan, the Nuba Mountains, South Sudan. Um, it was known as the first civil, civil war in Sudan maybe but by my book is the second civil war in Sudan because the first one is actually kind of closer to the, the time of the independence of Sudan. Um, and that is what always kind of make me think what the climate violence or violence climate, which one led to the other. Um, so the, 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 the continuance of the war, what, what is the motive, what is the drive of the people to kind of to succumb, to use only weapons as a way to resolve their conflict? Um, and to give you another picture of what is happening and the impact of this probably in the regions in general, some of you might actually remember the Raina the Northern Raina. The, the Northern Raina, the Rhinosaurus, I think the, the name of it, is kind of um, one of the kind of endangered animals and actually extinct at the moment, I think. Just, there's only two females, I think, left as far as I can remember. Um, these animals is actually um, kind of the habitat of these animals is Uganda, Sudan, South Sudan, Central Africa. If you looked at what's happening in this part of the, the world, there, there is kind of a, a, an ongoing conflict for kind of decades. And I am not quite sure whether the, these animals became endangered because of the activities of the human beings in this area, or is, it is because there is other things, the kind of the agricultural activities that is, have led to change on the, the, the whole situation. But this is kind of just on animals, but we can, we can look at other animals, which is the capital of Sudan, which is called Khartoum. It's actually the name, it comes from the elephant trunk. Precisely, they think it, the elephant used to live in that area. Well, while I was a child living in the outer skirt of Khartoum, I never seen anyone. And that, that, that I have no idea when, when those animals have gone. 
the area where I came from, which is my roots, is South Kordofan, the Nova Mountains. It was lush and green and beautiful, and it's a hilly area. But it's, it's no longer kind of that area that a lot of us kind of could actually live in because of the ongoing conflict. We lost so many lives. Thousands of people been displaced from these areas. A lot of you have for sure heard about Darfur. My record of Darfur is 1983. There was a drought which has hit, hit the whole Horn of Africa. I remember there is people have actually walked from North Darfur to the outskirts of the capitals. The lorries which has been seen, the, the lucky people come on lorries, but most of the people met this journey on foot. The journey between North Darfur and Niala to the outskirts of the capital is about 800 plus kilometers. Could you imagine that? Somebody walking all this just because there is no food, there is nothing. So this is from the 80s. I'm telling you this because this is happening, happens in my lifetime. Gradually, life became quite impossible for the people on these areas. It's either because of the warning or because of the shortage of food or the shortage of water. Today, the people who live in the capitals of, the, of Sudan, are in the, not very far from the Nile, they are not able to access water. There is really, really problems with the infrastructure in the country. Sudan or South Sudan. Uh, that video has actually, which is we just, Dominique has shown you, that sits the new South Sudan. It's a new country, but heavily burdened with mass kind of uh, displaced people. So it's the country who's actually, is not able to stand on its feet, but he has to look after people who have been displaced. Could you believe that? And that's numbers of people. Uh, so in 20, which is not very far, 20, 2011, 70,000 people have actually fled South Cordova and Nuba Mountains to go to South Sudan. And before 2013, the numbers got become 100. Today, we have exchanged the numbers of people. To like 2,000 people has actually fled Sudan to, to South Sudan and vice versa. And precisely people who are living in, dis, being displaced from both sides are living in a very miserable situation. Not an easy situation. I understand that. But this is kind of the message we wanted to, to kind of take to the world that we live in this world together. We are interlinked. The weapons that the poor people are actually using to fight each other, most of it is actually manufactured in other countries. I started Green Core Defy in 2010. I know how difficult to transport 100 kilograms from the UK to South Sudan. It costs a lot of money. But that heavy weapons can get there. I really, it's beyond my belief how they it can get there. So it's, it's, it's awareness raising, I think, is very important, putting priority to the, the best, best way to kind of handle conflict is, is so important. Empowering the, the people in the country to have proper leadership is so important. During my life, early life of the child, my country was actually sanctioned. So we got war, we got sanctions. We couldn't get food in in the country. We couldn't have proper education as well. Today, if you wanted to access Twitter in Sudan, it's not easy. Uh, internet to get it to South Sudan as well is it's not it's not easy. Um, so those are the things to kind of make technology possible for those countries to move on. And the right technology as well is so important. I'd like to kind of um, give you a chance 
to kind of um, reflect on what, what I said. And I'd like to welcome you to ask me questions, if I could actually answer any questions about Sudan or South Sudan or about the reasons uh, that people have actually been displaced. But before we get there, um, I run a charity called Green Code Fan, and I called it Green Code Fan because I recognize that is should that's it could actually if we looked after it, it could produce hope for tomorrow, which is the children of today who are actually could be a, f a future for tomorrow. I lived among those people and I heard it as well from other people who actually visited the two countries. They are very generous people. They are very lovely people and really loving people. And, 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 and the killing which we see is, I cannot explain it to you because I myself is still struggle to see an explanation for it. But I think if we could actually remind the people, you know, and, and, and kind of really kind of um, touch the humanity on the people down there, we might actually help them if we manage to kind of um, educate them to kind of to work on their resources in, an, in the best possible way, we could actually create the climate and the environment which is actually help the whole region to have some stability, not just the two countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raja. And uh, with all that, and thank you for your invitation to engage with what you've told us and for your generosity in sharing your story. Um, and now's a chance, I'm gonna hand over to Teresa for some minutes where everybody can ask some questions or make some comments that you'd like to make. And Teresa's going to convene it. You might like to put something in the chat or wave, wave a real hand and, um, and your chance will come. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you to to all of the speakers. Um, I think actually someone has just posted a question in the chat, and this is from Trevor. And Trevor says, um, "Losing your home is like bereavement. What can we do individually, nationally?" or the United Nations, can we have information on how and where to help? Is anyone able from our speakers to pick up that question, please? Can I try? Yes, Raga. Um, I mean, it's, uh, we, got, uh, we got that chance earlier when Alison asked about home. From my own perspective, it's home is where you can actually feel really safe and be yourself. Home could be in any country, in any place. And it's, it's, it cannot be, you know, you cannot actually specify it to, to certain place. So you can make home in your own home to somebody else. You can make home in, in social media to someone else to accommodate them. You can make home in your in your kind of in your chair to, 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 to others in your heart if you can actually remember people well that that is as well kind of harming them just that is what i can actually say about home because it's not just the four walls um it's not the gift you can give it's not the money um it's just to make someone welcome and to make someone feel like he can be belong or he can, you know, share the space with you. You can appreciate that they are present. Yes, and that, that, that's a really lovely thought because it's something that we can all do. We can all offer friendship, which uh, that, that's what I've, I felt that you were saying, that to other people and just make people feel welcome and really that they're not alone. Um, so that's the impression I got from you, Raga. Dominic, Dominica. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Raja. Um, I just want to add to that, to, to Trevor, uh, that Trevor can make, can be, um, 
pivotal in helping others feel at home. But the question here is how? So I would encourage Trevor to get in touch with me um, and we can have a chat. Um, we can explore what's in your hands, uh, Trevor, what you can do within your comfort zone. I can send some links, uh, also other organizations, and you can choose um, you know, what you're comfortable in doing, where you can help. Thank you. Um, actually, just thinking about that, is that something that can be shared with all of us for us to think about how we can help other people in these yes, situations? Of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, because I'm just sort of thinking we could potentially put this type of information on the website as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Um, because I think... I think from what everybody has said, it does seem such a big, a big issue and a big problem and trying to find some way to help um, can feel very, very difficult. So anything that anyone can tell us that, that we can do um, from, from the, the things that you've, you've said, uh, then that will be absolutely brilliant because then we'll be able to help and hopefully make some sort of positive contribution and make people feel at home in some sort of way. Yeah, do we have time to share a short video? I think it's two minutes. Um, what do we think? Two minutes? Is everybody happy if we just look at a two minute video and then we'll be closing? Okay, Raja, yes, do go ahead. Thank you. I just thought I'd share this with you to give you some ideas. Thank you, uh, Raga. If I perhaps take uh, a moment then to say uh, a huge thank you to our three speakers tonight. Um, it's been uh, challenging, uh, at moments overwhelming, uh, and encouraging that we can do something, especially when we do it together. And to bring us to conclusion where we began with Sunday's gospel reading and those parables about what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus said it's like a mustard seed, the smallest of seeds. And those parables were inviting people to join the story of changing the world of being part of a sustainable earth by bringing the smallest thing they have, the smallest thing, the mustard seed. And that's what you and I, might feel like tonight about being so small in the midst of this global challenge and yet the scriptures encourage us all that you and I bring so tonight we'll share some of the information about how we can each be involved and we've perhaps all of us uh, most of us in the room have learned about a new option for our giving and our action and how we can learn more and our speakers generously offering us more and, uh, and to think about where we are and how we can offer that gift by sharing our stories. Uh, our last word before um, saying goodnight and a, and a big thank you. The land that uh, I call um, my country of birth, my homeland, uh, has taught me a lot about the conversation we've had tonight about how important home is. In Tuneo Māori, the indigenous language of the uh, first people of Aotearoa New Zealand, the word for land and the word for placenta are the same word. And it's about home and about that sense of it connected up. The dots are absolutely joined in our sense of self-understanding as being people of this earth. And when you introduce yourself, if you're Māori, the first thing you say about yourself is not your name, but it's the land that you're from. You tell someone about the land you're from, and that helps them understand who you are. And so tonight, to all our speakers, we got a glimpse into the many lands you're from, and we think about our own, and we think about the call of the scriptures to make a home for all the birds of the air on this earth, and that what we bring, even if it feels small and insignificant, 
makes a difference in the world. So be encouraged tonight. Be hope-filled. We're going to share lots of links with all of you, and we want to say thank you, thank you, and a million times thank you, Joyce, Dominica, and Raga, for the stories, the challenge, the information, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the gift that you've shared with us. And we've connected the dots tonight. We've made, seen some new faces and the start of some new friendships. And so can I wish you every blessing as you go into this evening. Um, for those who feel able to, shall we share the words of the grace? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.